Johnny Flaherty is from Roslindale, and he began writing poetry about 30 years ago. And I wrote when he was 10. <laughs> he bought a guitar to try to become a singer-songwriter. And he noted that he felt he couldn't master the guitar nor write music, but people were liking his voice and his lyrics. So he said, I ditched the guitar and here I am. He retired five years ago and he has been writing and performing since. Johnny is a storyteller who brings his tales to spoken word venues and local open mics, including Roslindale Open Mic, Speak Up with Tony Toledo and Don White and Lynn, and Ellen Schmidt's open mics in different areas, as well as venturing into local pubs where his everyman style, according to Johnny, has caught bar flies by surprise. And he has a collection of some of his poetry in a book titled Ebbing and Flip Fibbing. He states that he is still a seeker of balance and harmony who believes that well-being in life resides mostly within the boundaries of solitude, family, clan, and community. And when asked why is it important to share the arts with community, uh, Johnny responded, community life is where creativity blooms and thrives. Creativity enables us to overcome our fears, which sets us free. Freedom raises our lives to a higher level, where we treat others more kindly, full circle. So with that, I would like, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Johnny Flaherty. Greetings, kindred spirits. I shall begin with a poem about the month of March. It's called In Like a Lion, Out Like a Lullaby. March for sure is an inscrutable month, testing our faith in February's shadow. With wind chill voodoo, snow white nor'easters, and frost on your windshield encores. Then, First day of spring, bada bing. <laughs> Night and day are equal. You and me are balanced with a renewed sense of wonder. I see daffodils popping up through the snow. I see shamrocks and a thousand smiles. I hear Danny Boy sung in Japanese. I hear pipes of pan in my dreams. Coping with nature's transitions, sire's lion-hearted resilience. That's that one. So I have my book. Uh, I'm going to read some poems from Ebbing and Fibbing. Copies down back. Uh, the first poem uh, is one about a cat, playing it safe, you might say. So this is called Tomcat. It's a hard life in the alley for an old Tomcat like me. Since I left my sweetheart Sophie sitting under the backyard tree. Got the urge to roam, gave up my home, and moved into the street. Now I must say I don't get much aid for most folks that I meet. So I'm an alley cat, and I like it like that. This wandering suits me fine. Freedom rings, temptation sings, and I give in every time. But fighting every night and stealing every day makes a tomcat pretty mean. With zero friends to forgive my sins, I'm saved by this haunting dream. I dream about a face I've seen someplace, don't recall how long ago. Those alarming eyes, that disarming smile, is it someone I'd like to know? I see this face when I turn around, but it's quite a ways behind. Should I move along? Should I stand my ground? I can't make up my mind. Is there someone watching over me? Well, I find out no one's really free. I always end up running down the road. 
Always wake up feeling brave and bold. Still, it's a hard life in the alley for an old tomcat like me. Many a day I do get weary searching for a bite to eat. Ain't got no cozy fireplace to curl my tail up to. It's raining out tonight and I'm quite a sight, but I won't trade places with you. Cause it's a chance to prance and hoot and holler. It's playing the game without a collar. It's hiss or miss in the midnight hour. It's the moment of truth in the quest for power. Wow! Wah wah wah! I have a kitty at home who usually makes up the audience of one when I'm <laughs> rehearsing, and uh, she's a pretty good listener for a cat. She doesn't uh, applaud, of course, but she manages to hold off on her yawning until I reach the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next poem is called Pearls. Join this jester on the path to Zen, who was juggling pearls labeled lose and win. His surname, Sylvester, his mood quite mellow. Bells on his cap gleam metallic blue. He said, uh, watch the pearls of my anxious fellow. The one I drop is my gift to you. When you're young, pearls of wisdom pass you by. Usually miss them due to roving eye. When you're old, these same pearls find a friend who'll embrace them, embellish them, pass them on to your kin. When you're in between, pearls of prudence slip into your life, talking your head into letting go of the knife. Waking the next morning, I find the jester gone, but the pearl on my pillow is one I can lean on, namely, no one's gonna do much to lighten your load, though you may lose your fear of the fork in the road. That's that one. This one's called The Bottomless Bottle. Sanctity of religion, sincerity of government, nobility of war. Remain the best sellers in the trade of snake oil craved by us masses down through the ages. Dab it round the eyes, rub it in the ears, and be sure to inhale Leave zero to chance. It's a bottomless bottle whose hologram label obfuscates one's prudence. Politicos and preachers are the usual distributors, ensnaring their patrons from all walks of strife. Sinners, spinners, winners, break out the bottle for all moral dilemmas. That's that one. I live in Rosendale on the Jamaica Plain Line, and a short distance away is a place called Forest Hill Cemetery, where I go walking regularly. It's actually a 275-acre Victorian theme park where people happen to be buried. Got a lake, flowers, birds, gnarly old trees, and statuary. Lots and lots of statuary. And I've got lots and lots of photos of all those things. So a few names of people who are buried there that you'll recognize. Uh, Eugene O'Neill, E.E. E. Cummings, and Sexton. Ann Sexton was buried there in the mid-1970s. Uh, while well, she was only in her mid-40s. So I learned a few details about her passing, embellished them a bit, and wrote this poem called 
All is clear. Annie opened the cabinet door, lifted out the tallest glass, filled it with vodka to the brim, held it up to the window light, and murmured, all is clear. <laughs> Waltzed out through the sheltered breezeway, connecting to the secured garage, where awaits her Chevy Malibu, azure blue, devoid of trim, just two small dents which weren't her fault. She starts the engine, flips on the radio, already tuned to the Brahms hour, rolls down the window, sips her vodka, slowly draws her eyelids down, unlocks her memory, and throws away the key. She sees herself at first communion, in purest white from veil to shoe. The envelopes with tens and twenties, the syrupy, heavenly hallmark cards, telling who's next in line for a hug. She sees herself in white once again, a surreal stroll down the sacred aisle, her turn for that once-in-a-lifetime glow outshining all the saints in the windows, whimsically aware of all the eyes she rules. Dancing live to the Glenn Miller Band, all aboard the Chattanooga Choo Choo. Life is bold and love is frisky, dwells on the joy of both her pregnancies and the guilt from wishing they'd never end. Her prestigious awards now turn pastel. Purple, pink, pale green, and yellow, spiraling upwards toward a cumulus sanctuary, like balloons escaped from a child's lax grip, stinging her hand while scarring her heart. Across from the doctor with the tape recorder, her lips are moving, but she hears no sound. Enthralled by the sin of being weightless, sees a white balloon with no string attached. Annie's glass is empty now, as is her Malibu. Thank you. That's Uh, this is another one from Forest Hills. True story, I might add. It's called Tripped. Went for a walk on a late afternoon in late November. The sun being low and the shadows long, I brought along my camera, winding through the cemetery of century-old trees and Victorian tombs guarded by angels of stone and of spirit, where nothing is presumed. Came upon a hawk, wingspan needing room, red tail to remember, graceful in the flow, silencer on the song, circling pond's perimeter, where it oft shops for quarry, Oh, come my way, please. Opportunity looms for photos of marvels. Indeed, he's paying a visit. What tax must I assume? The hands of the clock freeze frame the scene between two pretenders. Up the hill I go, with faith fairly strong. The prey is a preener. Low perched across from me, on a bow in the breeze, up close in the zoom, he's posing for angles. I'm snapping ecstatic. He's captured. I'm consumed. Now you can squawk, don't need you no more. Going home to my blender. Steep going below, but not can go wrong for this dauntless descender cascading nonchalantly on slip-and-slide leaves. 
but I speak too soon. As the ground turns level, a nosedive right into it, spewing blood by the spoon. Aftermath. Found what I was seeking by the grace of God, plus the wonder of being tripped by a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, this poem is about the afterlife. It's called Free Will. Flying up to heaven on the wings of a raven, with trumpets blaring and banners waving. Open those gates and slide me inside. I'm free of baggage and I paid for the ride. Now you enjoy free will during life on earth. Mostly everyone agrees. So who's to say that after you die, you still can't do as you please? But who would take free will away? It's not what you'd expect from God. So getting to choose between heaven and hell shouldn't really seem so odd. Now supposing there is no dark inferno at the end of your crooked trail of sins. And it turns out, hell is but a carnival, where anything goes and everyone wins, including those pleasures you heard about but never thought you'd find. Well, upstairs, heaven's offering you merely a blissful state of mind. Well, my turn to choose is drawing near with the tolling of the bell. And so many of my favorite feasts are on the calendar down in hell. But heaven is now the humble choice for this reformed gigolo. So it's hello, psychedelic dreams. Goodbye, my dear libido. <laughs> Flying up to heaven on the wings of a raven, with trumpets blaring and banners waving. Unfold those mysteries that baffle me so. Then tell me how come there's no one here I know. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'd like to thank Cheryl for giving me the opportunity to feature here at Wake Up and Smell the Poetry and Feel the Energy. And thank you all for your attention and support. And I'll leave you with a new poem, a short one. It's called Did Not Need Corroboration. They burned her at the stake today for seeking truth in nature. At the age of only 30, just entering adulthood, she did not believe in their miracles, nor their parameters of sin, would not contribute tithing to make sermon ears plump. She could not read, could not write, yet her eyes were clear with certitude which did not need corroboration from chanting multitudes. She simply believed that harmony was more desirable than sanctity. Thank you very much. I have this old dog. He's nearly blind, can hardly see. He trips over the black cat on the dark green rug at dusk and stumbles on stairs, once launching himself recklessly down half a flight to avoid the uncertainty of where to place his paws. He's deaf as a stump until the doorbell rings. Then he lurches to attention like the nutty professor in Back to the Future ready to defend his castle. For two years, we lived in a place with no doorbell, and when we returned, he'd forgotten that doorbell spelled danger. That was nice while it lasted. 
He bites when I try to pick him up, but his teeth are worn and his gums sore, so he's just a shadow of his former ferocity. And the indignity can't even get his teeth cleaned or pulled because the next time he goes under anesthesia, he's down for good, and I'm not ready for that. When we walk in the rain, he winces with every assault from an unseen enemy he tries vainly to avoid. It's hard watching my dog grow old. He was never fat, handsome and lean in his prime, but now his flesh has wasted away. Bones protrude like a baby bird, fragile as a whisper on a windy day. He tucks up into a tiny ball to sleep, curls up into himself, a nested comma or parentheses around pure love. And his eyes, let me tell you about his eyes. To appreciate my dog's eyes, you have to know something about his eyebrows and about my daughter, who is obsessed with drawing eyebrows on him so he doesn't get a complex from having a naked face. <laughs> I came home one day a few years ago and he bounded to the door to greet me, a quizzical, comical look on his fawn face enhanced by expressive dark eyebrows. <laughs> Under those undignified eyebrows lie the most adoring eyes a person could ever be lucky enough to see. Even now, clouded by cataracts, they beam unconditional love that I barely deserve. He makes me a better person with those eyes. With love like that, how do you decide when it's time to close the curtain on this life beyond the inconvenience of incontinence and not having company because it sets him on edge till he paces relentlessly in a rush to get nowhere? How do you decide when love should die? My plan for now is to pray each day that when it's time for him to leave this mortal life, that he lay his head down and drift away so the decision doesn't have to be mine. To the glory of the one who framed me, who knit me together in my mother's womb, I give thanks for all of those questions, the answers to which I will never know. You know that is enough. So I give up. I give up the search, but not the wonder. I give up the striving, but keep the grace, and most selfishly, the mercy, my undeserved gifts. I will seek ever after to offer them back as praise. Happy spring. So I said to the rabbi about these plagues that hit Egypt were really due to a volcano. And he's looking at me with his nice tie and beard like I'm a Philistine or something. Just cause when I walked into the temple, there he was up on the bima with the Bible talking about the blood, the frogs, the lice, the beasts, the epidemics, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, firstborn. And it reminds me of this book I just read about the ancient island of Kaftar, how the men wore short kilts and showed off there with big cod pieces and had nice pottery and used to sail the nearby Egypt. But then the volcano on the next island exploded and that's when all the bad things started happening. You know, the blood, the frogs, the lice, the beasts, the epidemics, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, firstborn. I mean, even the Bible says the hail was laced with fire and thunder. It says the air was dark for three days that brother could not see brother. It says these plagues prove the existence of God. Ko'omer Adonai. The Lord said, Bizot tedaki, through this shall you know, ani Adonai, that I am God. But the book said it was sulfuric ash pouring down from the sky like acid rain, like smoke on the dying, tempering cat against serpent, a glass clear river becoming polluted murk. The eruption was 30 times larger than Mount St. Helens. 42 billion tons of rock were pulverized into dust to be sucked up by the living, coughed up by the dead. Ki shadei Adonai at Plishtim as the Philistines, remnants of the Isle of Kaftar, were destroyed by the Lord. 
I'm explaining what he just read it, and the rabbi's looking at me like I'm a Philistine, which just means see people, you know, and what I really want to do is tell them. They called it blood as it hit all the rivers and the streams, killing fishes, filling dishes and stone bowls so that teams of green frogs started croaking in the muck and the goo, and they jumped head and rump for the land, wouldn't you? Dicey lice thought it nice as they wriggled in the crust, making glue in the stew as they burrowed in the dust. Hairy beasts on the hoof got alarmed, made a dash for the trees in the breeze, going wild with a rash, rash, it's an epidemic, and I think systemic. Nothing's antiseptic. Quick, I'll get my tunic. This is much too toxic, and so very cosmic. And big boils from the ash then broke out upon their skin, and they itched, and they ditched, and they yelled out, we can't win, till the hail, big as rails from the sky, fell so hard. Lightning hits, thunder blitz, killing Amrith in the yard. And the locust, hocus pocus, and as fast as bugs could chew, what a feast. To say the least, no one else knew what to do. And the darkness from the ash cloud came and took away their sight. Where's my bro? Where's my bro? It's been three days without light, and my firstborn isn't coping with the wear upon his body. And he died, and I cried. Why is this happening? And I'm realizing if that volcano had exploded, then the rabbi would be standing there, not with his yarmulke on, but a short skirt with his you-know-what hanging up. And then he died, and I cried, why is this happening? Must be God. Thank you. <laughs>